It's been 20 years since the director Stanley Kubrick, or should I say auteur, passed away. After all, he should be referred to as an auteur, as his directing practices really apply to the definition of an artist filmmaker who applies a highly centralized and controlling aspect to his film work. Just like the artistic nature that comes from being an author of a novel or a play. In short, Stanley Kubrick was an American film director, producer, screenwriter, and photographer. Many people have cited him as one of the greatest filmmakers in cinematic history. Being a demanding perfectionist, Kubrick was notorious for demanding multiple takes during filming to perfect his art and his relentless approach was often extremely demanding for his actors. Jack Nicholson, who played in the Kubrick-directed movie The Shining, revealed that the director would often ask up to 50 takes of a scene. Despite the relentless notoriety that he built in the industry, many of Kubrick's films broke new ground in cinematography and make his 13 feature films some of the biggest treasures in the history of filmmaking. That being said, and knowing that he is one of the biggest directors of all time, who is Stanley Kubrick exactly? Stanley Kubrick was born on July 26, 1928 in New York and was raised in the Bronx. Throughout his schooling, he received average grades but always displayed a keen interest in literature, photography, and film. After graduating high school, he taught himself all aspects of film production and directing and started working as a photographer for Look magazine in the late 1940s. During that time, even though his colleagues recalled that they thought he lacked the personality to make it as a director in Hollywood, just due to his quiet, thin, and poor demeanor, Kubrick still managed to quickly become known within the magazine for his great storytelling and photographs. His first photography story was published on April 16, 1946, and was entitled A Short Story from a Movie Balcony, and staged as an argument between a man and a woman, during which the man is slapped in the face, caught genuinely by surprise. Despite what people thought of him personality-wise, Kubrick shared the love of film with his school friend Alexander Singer. Through Singer, Kubrick learned that during those times making a proper short film would cost $40,000, which was beyond his means. With $1,500 in savings, Kubrick managed to produce a few short documentaries fueled by Singer's encouragement. During that time, he began learning all he could about filmmaking on his own, calling film suppliers, laboratories, and equipment rental houses. His first short film was entitled Day of the Fight, which was about a boxer called Walter Cartier, whom he had photographed and written about for Look Magazine a year earlier. Kubrick found money independently to finance it and rented a camera for it producing a 16-minute black and white documentary. This short film already used Kubrick's famous backtracking shot, which follows Cartier and his brother walking towards the camera. This type of shot became one of Kubrick's characteristic camera movements. After a score was added to the film, Kubrick ended up spending a total of $3,900 in making it, and sold it to RKO Pate for $4,000, which was the most the company had ever paid for a short film at that time. Thanks to the newly found confidence of making and selling a successful short film, he made Flying Padres in 1951, which documents a reverend who travels 4,000 miles to visit 11 churches. In 1953, he made The Seafarers, which was Kubrick's first color film. All these shorts inspired Kubrick to quit his job at Look Magazine and really try to make it as a professional filmmaker. Each short being better than the other, Kubrick was able to raise thousands from friends and family. This was his initial finance to begin making his first feature in 1953 entitled Fears and Desire. In order to film this, Kubrick assembled several actors and a small crew totaling 14 people, 5 actors, 5 crewmen, and 4 others to help transport the equipment. The film was shot in the San Gabriel Mountains in California for a period of 5 weeks. The story is set during a war between two unidentified countries. An airplane carrying 4 soldiers from one country has crashed 6 miles behind enemy lines. After surviving the crash, the soldiers must survive in order to find their battalion. 
during their escape they come across a local peasant girl which they tie up and many horrible events ensue. This movie is a sort of philosophical view about war and how man is not made for it. Fears and Desire was a commercial failure and Kubrick himself expressed embarrassment for it, attempting over the years to keep prints of the film out of circulation. Despite this failure, he made a feature which fueled Stanley Kubrick to start writing a new boxing film based in the noir aesthetic with Howard O. Sackler. The film went through various titles but was eventually released as A Killer's Kiss in 1955 and is a 67 minute film about a heavyweight boxer's involvement with a woman being abused by her criminal boss. This movie was again privately funded by Kubrick's family and friends with around $40,000 invested by his Bronx pharmacist named Morris Boos. Kubrick began shooting footage for his film in Times Square and frequently explored cinematography by using unconventional angles and imagery. This movie was influenced by Hitchcock's 1929 movie Blackmail, with a painting laughing at a character. In turn, Scorsese said that Kubrick's boxing movie with its atmospheric shots and innovative angles influenced him on the 1980 film Raging Bull. Killer's Kiss was met with limited commercial success and made very little money in comparison with its production budget of $75,000. Even though the camera work is amazing for the time, its acting and story are generally considered mediocre. While playing chess in Washington Square, Kubrick met producer James B. Harris, who considered him the most intelligent, most creative person he had ever come in contact with. The two formed the Harris Kubrick's Pictures Corporation in 1955. Harris purchased the rights to Lionel White's novel Clean Break and Kubrick wrote the script with the help of noir novelist Jim Thompson. The movie eventually became The Killing and was released in 1956. The film tells the story of career criminal Johnny Clay who recruits a sharpshooter, a crooked police officer, a bartender and a betting teller named George among others for one last job before he goes straight and marries his fiancée, Faye. When George tells his restless wife about the scheme to steal millions from the racetrack where he works at, she creates a plot of her own. This movie was Kubrick's first full-length feature shot with a professional cast and crew. Being made in Hollywood under union rules, Kubrick was not permitted to both direct and be the cinematographer of the movie, so Lucien Ballard, a veteran in the industry, was hired for the shooting. Kubrick clashed throughout the film with Ballard following many camera disputes. Many contemporary critics of the time heavily criticized the film, but today's critics consider this movie amongst the best films of Kubrick's early career. Despite what critics said, Dor Sherry of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer was highly impressed and offered Kubrick and Harris $75,000 to write, direct and produce a film which ultimately became Paths of Glory. This movie was actually Kubrick's first significant success and it established him as an up and coming young filmmaker. Critics praised the film's unsentimental and unvarnished combat scenes and its raw black and white cinematography. The reason that Shari wanted to produce this movie was because MGM at the time would not finance another war picture, given their effort to support another anti-war film entitled The Red Badge of Courage. As for Kubrick's Paths of Glory, it eventually garnered the interest of Kirk Douglas, who took on the role of Colonel Dax. As for the movie, it is set during World War I, where Commanding General Brulard orders his subordinate General Miro to attack a German trench position, offering a promotion as an incentive. Though the mission is recklessly bold to the point of suicide, Miro commands his subordinate Colonel Dax to plan the attack. When the mission ends in disaster, General demands the court martial of three random soldiers in order to save face. In order to make the movie battle scene spectacular, Kubrick meticulously lined up six cameras one after the other along the boundaries of no man's land, with each camera capturing a specific field and numbers and gave each of the hundreds of extras a number for the zone in which they should perish. Kubrick himself operated an R-Reflex camera for the battle, zooming in on Douglas. 
The film was banned in France till 1974 for its unflattering depiction of the French military and was censored by the Swiss Army until 1970. After this first initial partnership, Kirk Douglas contacted Kubrick asking him to direct his next movie Spartacus, which would eventually be released in 1960. This movie was produced by Douglas, who eventually starred as the title character Spartacus and cast Laurence Olivier as his foe, the Roman general and politician Marcus Licinius Crassus. Spartacus follows the story of Thracian Spartacus, who was born and raised as a slave. After being sold to a gladiator trainer named Bacchetus, Spartacus is trained for weeks in order to kill for the arena. During that time, Spartacus turns on his owners, and this leads to other slaves in rebellion. As the rebels move from town to town, their numbers become bigger as more slaves join their ranks. Under the leadership of Spartacus, they make their way to southern Italy where they will finally cross the sea and return to their homes. Spartacus was an enormous movie with a cast of over 10,000 and a budget of 6 million. At the time, this was the most expensive film ever made in America, and Kubrick became the youngest director in Hollywood history to make an epic. Despite Kirk Douglas and Stanley Kubrick being at odds over the script, with Kubrick angering Douglas when he cut all but two of his lines from the opening 30 minutes, Spartacus was nominated for six Academy Award nominations and won four of them, establishing Kubrick as a major director. Well, this was the first part of a three-part retrospective on Kubrick's career. As you can tell, his rise to directing films that would eventually be praised by audiences and critics took many years in the making. In the second video, I will focus on the second part of his career until the mid-70s. Please be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. Leave me a comment too if you have any favorite moments from Kubrick's career. After all, he was a pioneer in filmmaking visuals and inspired many contemporary directors. Well, okay, that's it. Have a great day, and I'll see you in the next video.